Uh, hey, there's a star man waiting in the sky. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield, a classic psychopath, incapable of emotion or regard for human life, a finely tuned machine, eager to destroy everybody and everything in his path, and Big Anklevich. The man is crazy. He's the devil incarnate. Makes Manson look like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> you know, like Hitler and Himmler. Ground control to Major Tom. <laughs> oh, Commencing countdown engines on. No! Sing it, come on. No more singing, please! Take your protein pills and put your loafers on. What do they say? Put your what helmet. on? Helmet on. There put we go. Put your helmet on. <laughs> For some reason, I blanked on it. No more singing, Rish. For the love of Luke Coddington. <sighs> okay. Welcome, everybody, to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield to ground control. <laughs> I'm feeling very scared. But I think Big Anklewich knows which way to go. <laughs> yeah, we've got a, uh, a... It's sort. This is sort of a special event, really. I mean, it's not a special event for the people that are listening because... Because they're in the future. They're in the future. But uh, it's a special event... For the Dune Steef. Um, uh, basically, what happened today is we are recording this 11th. on June. I almost said June. On January 11th, which is nine months ago for you guys, <laughs> was the day that David Bowie died. Maybe you guys remember that day. Maybe it's been so long you can't anymore. But um, basically, I figured it would be cool. It would be a, a, an interesting thing to do to take this story, which I wrote about a year and a half ago, something like that. And we would put this story on the show and then we could talk about David Bowie. And uh, I don't know, our, our impressions. It's, it's, it's not every day that I write a story with somebody's name in the title. That's a real person. And then that person passes away. And it's an important person, and it's, I don't know, it just seems like a confluence of a lot of things that come together and make something worth doing. Yeah, it's, it, I'm, I think it'll be fine if we do this episode, as long as you promise that the next story you write has Polly Shore's name in the title. <laughs> you think he's going to die soon? Oh, only if you write that story. <laughs> so it, tell people what the story is called, if you will. <laughs> The story is called Chloe, Joey, Zoe, and David Bowie by B.D. Anklevich. And it's probably self-explanatory. Uh, we just run the story, but uh, I, I seem to have vague memories that you titled it this just to piss me off. <laughs> Does that sound correct? <laughs> that could be true. Okay. I mean, it's part. There's more to it than that, but we'll talk about the title after the oh. after the story. Okay. All right, so yeah, we're just going to head into the story and hope you enjoy it. Oh. Chloe, Joey, Zoe, and David Bowie by B.D. Anklovich. I'd realized that today would be the greatest day of my life, that all my dreams would come true in one shot, and that I'd meet David Bowie. Not THE David Bowie, but David Bowie nonetheless. Maybe I would have worn something cuter, or spent some more time fixing my makeup after it all went to hell. I had a napkin in my purse, and I used it to wipe away the smeared mascara. My eyes were still pretty red, but that could easily be overlooked or explained away if it wasn't overlooked. But I'd be damned if I was going to make it obvious that Mom and I had been in yet another screaming match by leaving streaks of running mascara on my cheeks like I was one of those guys from Kiss? Or what was that other guy? Um, Alice Cooper, I think, was his name. I looked into the cracked face of the compact mirror and did my best to repair the damage. 
My face, before I'd gone to the front door and told my mom I was leaving, had been a masterpiece of modern design. It had taken a full half hour to get everything just the way I'd wanted it. Damn my mom and her bottomless lake of bitchiness. How could someone who was widely known as the town whore, believe me, I've heard it a thousand times from the bullies at school, be so disapproving of every damn thing that I wear? So what if you could see my belly button? At least I wasn't sucking guys off behind the diner when I got off work. I didn't do that shit. I was never going to be like my mom. Never. I looked back at the mirror. It was really hard to see anything since it was so small and broken to boot, but I had to fix up the damage that the tears had done. There was no way I was going to show up at Joey's house looking like this. I had a major crush on Joey, and I insisted that Joey see me at my best. But it was going to take a while, so I figured I ought to duck out of sight. A big maple tree in the field next to the feed store served my purpose nicely. I did have to be quick, though, because the sun would be down soon and the light was failing. After mopping up the wet mascara, I pulled out my eyeliner pencils. First blue and then hot pink. My inspiration, as usual, was David Bowie on the cover of Aladdin Sane. Not so much the design as the colors. Although I did do the red lightning bolt on my face a couple of Halloweens ago when I dressed as Ziggy Stardust, that wasn't the plan tonight. But I love the colors he used in those days, so I always tried to use as much color as I could. Once the damage was patched up, I got back on the road. Joey's house was only a five-minute walk from the trailer me and my mom shared. Joey's parents had good jobs. They were both teachers at the county high school, and so Joey had access to a car. Once I made it there, the world would open up before me like an oyster bearing its pearls. It only took a minute, and I was knocking on the door. Mr. Davis opened it. He'd been my math teacher for two years, and I couldn't see him without getting flashbacks at the horrors of mathematics. Luckily, Joey and me didn't spend a lot of time at their house. Hey, Mr. Davis, I'm here to see Joey, I said. Sure. Just a minute. Come in. He went to the stairs and shouted for Joey. It was only a moment before she appeared. She was radiant, as usual. Long, black, spiraling curls. Smooth, unblemished skin. Shining white teeth. Deep, dark eyes. And a slim figure that was nevertheless rounded in all the right places. I was always both lustful and jealous at the same time whenever I saw her. Oh, and yes, Joey was a girl. Her name was actually Joy, but before she was even old enough to walk, her family decided that the diminutive form of Joy was Joey. You wouldn't think that a name that short needed a diminutive, but there you go. Hey, Joey, you look great, I said. I was careful to make it sound like a compliment you get from a girlfriend rather than from your girlfriend, but it was hard. I wanted her like a cat burglar wants a priceless diamond. We were best friends, but every last thing about that was difficult. I could never relax and truly be myself with her because my feelings for her were always in the way, and I couldn't just come out and tell her either. I mean, this is a small town in Montana. If you're in the closet, you stay in the damned closet. You could come out when you grew up and you and that closet moved to California or somewhere like that where they were understanding of those kinds of things. Besides, I had no reason to believe that she'd be receptive to the idea at all. And that's just one of those things in the LGBT code or whatever. You didn't impose yourself on someone that was straight. So I had to feel her out. She seemed to like boys. After all, I'd been sitting across the room at a party one time when she was making out with Toby Barnard. He'd had a hand up her shirt and everything, and she sure didn't seem to be objecting. That didn't mean it was a no-go, though. Most gays try to be straight to begin with. At least, that's what I'd heard. Besides, even I like boys. I've made out with a bunch of them. I swing both ways, and I can only hope that perhaps she does too. Seems like a long shot, I know, but I can't help it. I'm going to hold on to that hope. Hey, Chloe. She said and pressed a book into my hand. I'm done with this one, so it's your turn. It was a paperback copy of John Scalzi's Fuzzy Nation. It was good, she said. I liked it. We did a lot of this exchanging books with each other. The three of us, Zoe included, you'll meet her soon enough. We're all bookworms, and our local library was always lacking in the kind of genre books we were looking for, so we bought them ourselves off websites and shared them around with each other. I loved it. It gave me something to do while hiding away from my mom. I'd put David Bowie in my ears, a book in front of my eyes, and I could forget for a nice long while just how shitty my life was. Joey grabbed her purse, a tiny little black thing with a gold chain strap, and her keys, and opened the front door. Goodbye, Daddy. She said, going up on her tiptoes and kissing her father on his cheek. Do I take the Camry or the Pilot? Doesn't matter, her dad said. 
Your mom and I are staying in tonight, so you can choose. Pilot it is. Out the door we went. We always took the pilot if we could. Not that it was especially cool, but it was miles ahead of a freaking Camry. I jammed a homemade disc of David Bowie songs into the player, and Let's Dance began pounding out of the speakers. Bowie was my thing, but I had managed to hook Joey and was getting my claws into Zoe as well. Either she was starting to like it or to hate it. When you listened to him as much as I did, there was no way to just be in the middle. Let's dance, the two of us shouted along with the song. Put on your red shoes and dance the blues. In mere moments, we were pulling up the dirt lane that led to the farmhouse that Zoe and her family lived in. They didn't farm anything, although they did keep a pretty amazing vegetable garden. They just lived there. And Zoe's parents were teachers, too. So we were all outcasts together. Zoe was waiting for us and opened the door before we even knocked. See you later, Mom! She yelled back into the house as she stepped out the door. Muffled from within, we could hear her mom shouting back. Bye! Be home by midnight! Zoe frowned. She hated being the one with the curfew happy parents. Joey's folks let her stay out till one if she wanted, and my mom didn't give a fuck if I came back at all. She was in Wonderland pretty much all night, every night. She wouldn't know when I came back even if she installed a punch clock. Zoe slammed the door and skipped out to the car, her long black hair bouncing with each step. Zoe was pretty as well, but in a much more geeky way. She wore glasses and was pudgy in a way that suggested she was probably going to blow up and get really fat once she became an adult and was in charge of her own meals. Her parents were health freaks, but they hadn't always been that way. A few years ago, the two of them had gone on a weight loss regimen and dumped a load of pounds. Now it was all salad and veggies and that kind of thing. But Zoe was always snacking on sweets and potato chips and soda whenever her parents weren't around. She loved that stuff and hated the fact that her parents had swapped their unhealthy habits for yoga and free weights. In fact, I was willing to bet that the first thing Zoe would do when we got in the car was ask to swing by the gas station so she could blow some money on junk food there. Shotgun! She called over her shoulder. Damn it, I'd forgotten! That's the problem you always have when you run in a pack of three friends. Somebody's got to sit alone in the back seat. I hated it because you can never hear what people are saying, especially when the music gets cranked up. And I was pretty sure that Zoe would eject my Bowie CD and put in some of that lame pop stuff that she liked. At least she didn't like country music like every single other person in this entire town and all the unincorporated areas around it as well. We all piled into the pilot, and Zoe immediately ejected my disc when she heard the opening bars of Bowie's fame. Ugh, I don't feel like Bowie right now, she said. She plugged her iPhone into the external jack and put on a Maroon 5 song. Adam Levine's unnatural-sounding voice filled the cabin of the car, and my brain twinged in protest. Hey, Zoe said, grabbing Joey's arm. Can we swing by the gas station? I gotta get me some sugar. You got to get your sugar on. Joey said, exaggerating the slang as deeply as a bookish geek like her could. We talk like this with each other a lot. It has started out as a way to subtly poke fun at all our peers who talk like that all the time. But sadly, it had gone past that now. We weren't making fun anymore. It was just part of our lexicon. I think I'm using that word correctly, lexicon. I saw it in a book a few weeks ago and have been itching for a chance to use it. Anyway, there's nothing more humorous than watching a guy dressed in cowboy boots, a western-style flannel shirt, and a Stetson say something like, I gots to get my sugar on. Montana was probably much better off back in the days before they invented things like television and YouTube to carry that kind of shitty slang down the wire until it infiltrated to every last hidden nook and safe haven in America. A rooster tail of dust blew up behind the pilot as Joey drove us off Zoe's property and back out onto Main Street which couldn't have been more apt since it was basically the only street in town. A moment later, we were at the Sinclair station, and Zoe loaded up on crap. She was probably the only person I knew that would leave the convenience store to gas station with enough stuff to need a bag. It was nice, though, because she let me mooch from her a lot, and that was important for someone as broke-ass as me. Joey drove us over to our spot, and we all got out and walked down the path that we'd made through repeated visits. Our spot was what we called it, although we all acknowledged the need for a better name than that. Zoe suggested we call it Under the Bridge Downtown, but that seemed a little too on the nose. And we couldn't call it that in front of other people, or they'd immediately figure out where we were talking about. And only Zoe liked the Red Hot Chili Peppers, so it didn't resonate with us. I wanted one of those comic book sounding names, like The Pit or The Hub or The Avengers Mansion, but they didn't really fit. So until we came up with something better, it was just going to be called Our Spot. 
Our spot was, you guessed it, under a bridge. It wasn't downtown, though, as if our town could be said to have something so grand as a downtown. It was actually several miles outside of town, where Roberts Creek went under the road. Since it was so close to the water, there were a lot of large trees there to lay under on hot summer afternoons, and it was remote enough that none of the douchebags that bothered us at school would ever know or care that it existed. Sadly, it was no use to us during the winter, because Montana winters were cold as the heart of the Arctic, and you did not want to be outside in one. But for a good two-thirds of the year, our spot was usable. We had an old metal footlocker that Joey had bought from an Army-Navy surplus store in Missoula, and we filled it with the stuff we didn't want to have to haul out here every time we came. We could lock it just in case someone came snooping around, and it was weatherproof too, so the stuff wouldn't be ruined if it rained. I went straight to it and pulled out the old computer speakers and ancient Sony Discman. The Discman was mine, so of course it was ancient. At least it still worked. I popped my Bowie CD in it and started it up. I skipped ahead, so it started on Suffragette City. Then I grabbed the ukulele from the footlocker, closed the lid, and sat down on top of it. Okay, I said. Check this out. I've been practicing. I started strumming along with the song. Joey drummed along her thighs, and both of them nodded along to the beat. Even Zoe liked Suffragette City. I mean, how could you not, right? Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am! I screamed and then strummed with zeal again, adding some hip-gyrating dance moves to the performance. Then it came to an end. Suffragette! I shouted, ending on a jump with a wave of the ukulele over my head. Wow! Joey said, and both of them clapped heartily. What do you think? I asked. It was at least as good as the Uke Skywalker video, right? Yeah! Joey said. Seriously, I think you need to start posting some videos of your own. Yeah, well, my camera doesn't want to work anymore. I think it may just be the program, so you never know. But right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen soon or anything. Zoe took the ukulele and started picking at it. I think she was trying to play that Gautier song, but Zoe wasn't very good, so I couldn't be sure. She stopped for a moment and reached into her shopping bag, removing a king-size Take 5 bar. She ripped it open and dumped out the three pieces it included and handed one to each of us. Here, she said and held her piece up in the air. A toast to the last night of summer. It was a wonderful few days. A hundred and four days, I said. Zoe smiled and went on. It was a wonderful few days, and we'll miss it. Hopefully this year will be better than last. May all the rodeo queen bitches and good old boys that give us shit every year burn in hell. We all raised our candy bars and clinked them together. Then we brought them back down to our mouths and took a bite. And may I win the lottery or something so I can finally get my own ride, I said, and raised my candy bar again. The others brought theirs up so they touched and brought them back down for another bite. And may... Joey began raising the nub of what was left of her candy bar. Each section of the take five wasn't all that big, so stretching it into three bites was difficult. This would surely have to be the last toast. May my mom finally... Just that and the whole place lit up like it was daytime. We all looked up as a huge fireball streaked across the night sky. It zoomed past us and disappeared over a hill to the north. Then there was a rumbling sound and a brighter flash of light that was mostly obscured by the hill. The three of us stood unmoving, staring northward, astounded. At last, Joey broke the silence. Holy shit! That was amazing! She shouted and started jumping up and down. I think that thing landed just over the hill, I said. What was it? A meteor, right? Yeah, I think so, said Zoe. We should... We should go and try to find it, you think? That would be so cool, I said. Come on, let's do it. I ran over and grabbed the speakers and discmen and shoved them back into the footlocker. I placed the ukulele with a little more care, since I paid actual money for it instead of just scrounging it out of the junk pile somewhere. I didn't get my hands on a lot of actual money, so it wouldn't be easy replacing it if I carelessly broke it. I snapped the lock shut and turned to Zoe and Joey. Let's go see if we can find this space oddity, I said with a big grin. Joey laughed and Zoe shook her head. As we walked the path back up to where the car was parked, Zoe said, Okay, I've never asked before, but I probably should have. What is your deal with David Bowie? Why do you like him so much? Shotgun, I called. I didn't want to be stuck in the back this time, so I called it long before the pilot was even in sight. Now, to me, asking Zoe's question was like asking someone why they felt it was necessary to eat, or why they insisted on breathing so much. How could you not like David Bowie? 
I mean, seriously, he was completely awesome. Even his weakest stuff was still totally soulful and deep, and his best stuff was the amazing things that legends are made of. But he was old now, a relic from the past, a forgotten piece of history that didn't get the kids excited like he once did in the 1970s and 80s. So I understood Zoe's non-belief. Besides, she didn't have the factors that I had that left me predisposed to love Bowie like I do. Well, I said as we climbed back into the pilot for the quest to find the meteor, it's sort of a long story, but if I boil it down, it mostly has to do with my dad. My dad had overdosed and died a few years after I was born. Up until that point, my family had been decently well off. But once my mom found herself the sole provider for our little family, things had quickly gone downhill. We lost our house and had to move into our shitty trailer, and so on and so on goes the sad story. I couldn't say that I missed my dad because when it came down to it, I never knew him. But I did miss the idea of a dad. I saw my friends interact with their dads and was always filled with envy. And I did my best to keep my dad alive in memories, at least. I was looking through his stuff once, I told Zoe as the car pulled out onto the road and headed north. And I found his music collection. He had a bunch of different things, but mostly it was Bowie. He had records, tapes, and CDs. Like every single thing that Bowie had ever done. Even those crappy remixes of I'm Afraid of Americans he did with Nine Inch Nails. I liked that song okay, but truth be told, I liked Young Americans a lot more than I did I'm Afraid of Americans. Maybe it was just because I was an American and felt a little betrayed as a fan of David Bowie to hear him tell me that I was scary. I don't know. She's speaking English, Zoe said. But for some reason, it doesn't seem like it anymore. What is I'm Afraid of Americans and what is Nine Inch Nails? It doesn't matter, I said. What matters is that my dad loved David Bowie. It was something that I discovered about my dad all on my own. So I decided to listen to all of those songs and see why he loved him so much. And basically, I found out that David Bowie was awesome. He could do anything. Rock, soul, funk, even EDM. You know he's like the only white guy ever to appear on Soul Train? He's totally awesome. What Soul Train? Joey asked. This surprised me. You don't know? Your parents have never talked about it or anything? No. Oh, weird. I would have thought they would have. Well, it was one of those shows from those days when they'd have bands come on and play their music, and there was a bunch of teenagers that danced on there and stuff. Only Soul Train was for blacks. They played soul music and disco and stuff. Oh, I get it. Joey said and rolled her eyes. So, it was your dad then? Zoe said, getting us back on subject. Yeah, my dad. Oh, and Bowie's totally gorgeous. I saw him in this movie from the 80s called Labyrinth. He was the bad guy, the Goblin King, but shit, was he gorgeous. Okay. And Zoe said, So you love Bowie because you love your dad, and because Bowie is hot like the sun. I can get behind that. Throw something in there. She pointed at the CD player and sat back in her seat. Her seat in the back, mind you, haha. <laughs> I popped my homemade disc back in the player and skipped it forward. A soft acoustic guitar filled the car, and then Bowie's distinctive voice crooned. Ground controlled, major tongue. We followed the road back from our spot until we reached the main street, which at this point was now just Highway 12. We drove a few miles until we were on the other side of the hill where the meteors seemed to have gone down. There was a dirt road that left the highway and headed back behind the hill, but Joey just pulled over to the side of the highway and parked. All right, she said. We're going to have to walk from here. I can't bring the car home with scratches on it or I was so here from my dad. You'd think that he'd let you take it off road since it's a freaking four-wheel drive SUV, Zoe said. Yeah, well, it's his baby, so no, he won't. Besides, what if I got a stuck or something? I can't really see very well out here in the dark. We'd never get to take the car out again. Okay, Joey, I said, touching her shoulder to get her attention, even though I didn't really need to. It was just an excuse to touch her, really. The pilot is awesome and all, but if you could have any car, if you had a bunch of money and could buy whatever car you wanted, what would you pick? That's easy. I want something really cute. I'd get a VW Bug. They are cute as a button. I saw one when I was in Missoula the last time that had these little things over the taillights that made them look like flowers. It was, oh, it was just so cute. You know, we wouldn't be able to take that up this dirt road either, Joey, said Zoe. We'd still be walking here. What about you, Zoe? I asked. What would you pick? I'd want something cute, too. I think I'd get one of those, um, PT cruisers. A That's PT what I'd cruiser? Get. Are you kidding me? I said. That's not a cute car. That's like an old person's car or something. It is not, Chloe, Zoe said, pushing me. 
old person, I said again, and ran up the path to stay out of reach of Zoe. When I made it to the road, I stopped to look back at Joey and Zoe, who were lagging behind me. You know what I'd get? I'd get a Mini Cooper. You want something cute? Those cars are super cute. And I'd get the convertible one? I saw headlights flash across Joey's face, illuminating her dark lips and flawless complexion, and then everything was pain. The world tumbled end over end as my body was blasted 15 feet down the roadway. Everything seemed to slow down, enough so that I was able to see the looks of surprised horror on Joey and Zoe's faces, and see that the car that had hit me was a dark green Land Rover with a California license plate. Then I crashed down to the pavement with a bone-breaking thud and the car passed over me one more time, its wheels crushing my abdomen, as if it felt the first blow hadn't been enough and it needed to make sure it had ended me. I was conscious long enough to see the brake lights on the back of the Land Rover illuminate momentarily, and then hear the wheels screech as they dug into the road to propel the car back to full speed. The bastard had just killed me, and he hadn't even had the decency to stop and see if there was anything that could be done. I cried out momentarily, but doing so only made the pain worse. I turned my head and saw Joey and Zoe's shocked faces in the moonlight. Then everything went black. But I didn't die after all. I regained consciousness after what appeared to be only a few moments, although I couldn't be sure just how long it was, considering that I was unconscious for it. My body was still crumpled and crushed, but the pain was gone. I don't know if my brain was filtering it out, or maybe when you reach a certain level of pain it just stops. I'm not a freaking doctor or anything. I was still gravely injured, though. I know that much. I couldn't move from the spot I occupied on the road, couldn't even twitch. Joey was on her knees leaning over me, her tears showering down on me while she held my wrist in her hand, searching for a pulse, still on her feet, holding her phone to her ear with one hand, while dragging her other hand through her hair in a gesture that perfectly communicated just how overwhelmed she was. Zoe was talking with what I assumed was a 911 operator. Tears were streaming down her face as well, turning her mascara into the same mess that mine had been when the evening began. I wanted to tell them that I was okay, that I wasn't in pain, but I couldn't make my mouth obey. A light filled the area, and Zoe's mouth dropped open at the same time that she dropped my wrist. Zoe stopped talking, pacing, and dragging her hand through her now very messy hair. Her cell phone slipped from her grasp as she, too, stared agape at the light that was emanating from something approaching us from across the road. I couldn't move to even swivel my head so that I could see whatever it was. I could move my eyeballs, but not far enough to get a good view. Joey and Zoe shrank back and clustered together, but as Zoe tried to shuffle away, Joey held her in place. She stepped around my body and positioned herself between the approaching light and me. My heart, damaged and crushed as it was, swelled with happiness. Joey loved me, enough to put herself in possible danger to protect me. It may not have been a romantic love, or maybe it was, that had yet to be tested, but it was a real love nonetheless. Just as the light entered my field of vision, it seemed to explode like a ruptured water balloon, only a light balloon instead. It blasted outward until it filled all of my vision. Like one of those white flash dissolves on movie trailers, for a moment I could see nothing but white. All detail of anything around me disappeared in the brightness of the light. Then, with an audible sucking sound, like wind rushing past my ears, the light retreated back into its source, and the sound of a miniature thunderclap rumbled across the road. And there, standing in the middle of Highway 12, was David Bowie. And, with the first movement that I had been able to do with anything other than my eyes, I gasped, What was going on? This must be a dream. How could David Bowie be standing in the middle of Highway 12? It wasn't THE David Bowie, that was for certain. It couldn't be, because David Bowie hadn't looked like this for 40 years. He was young, his hair dyed bright red, and cut in that mullet like he'd worn it when he'd been Ziggy Stardust. In fact, he was dressed in Ziggy's clothes as well, knee-high red boots, and a red and gold striped bodysuit with huge gold shoulder pads and a high gold collar. And painted in the center of his forehead was a large gold circle. What the? Whispered Joey, drawing it out long and slow, completely baffled. Zoe didn't let her finish. What's going on? She yelled. Who the fuck are you? The apparition of David Bowie smiled and quietly said, Hello? Zoe was not calmed by this. Who the fuck are you? This time, it wasn't a question. It seemed like more of a challenge. Again, quietly and calmly, it said, I'm David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust. I've come to help you. 
Please excuse me, but the girl behind you, Chloe Granger, needs my help. His voice was melodic and beautiful, as though he were singing one of his many famous songs, only in spoken form somehow. Bowie gently pushed his way between Joey and Zoe and knelt by my side. He was gorgeous. Oh, so gorgeous. My body unlocked enough that I could move even further, and I smiled as wide as I could. It probably looked ghastly. I'm sure my face was covered with blood. It probably gushed from my mouth when I smiled. I didn't feel it, so maybe it didn't. I couldn't really feel anything at this point, though. But even if I had, I didn't care. Seeing David Bowie there before me, kneeling at my side and touching me, just made me happy. This may tickle a bit, he said, and his fingers began to glow. He set his hand on my chest. The glow brightened until I could no longer see his hands. Then I noticed that I was glowing as well. With the glow came sensation. All the pain I had felt when the car hit me, but had been blocked from me since, dropped onto me like a bucket of ice water. I shrieked. I bucked and thrashed under Bowie's hand, but he pressed harder and held me in place. Stop it! I heard Joey shouting. Leave her alone! She's been hurt enough already! The pain was collapsing in on itself, though. Already the agony was only half what it was before Joey had started shouting. Like the light burst that had resolved itself into the form of David Bowie before, the pain burst sucked backwards like a rushing wind until it coalesced into one tiny ball under Bowie's hand. He smiled and raised his hand away from me. My chest rose for several inches as if pulled by an invisible string, and then finally that string seemed to snap and I dropped back to the asphalt. In David Bowie's hand was a ball of what could have been called dark light. It glowed around the edges, and there were sparkling facets within it, but otherwise it was as black as a windowless room with the light off. Bowie closed his hand over the ball, brought it to his mouth, and blew over his fist like a sleight-of-hand artist finishing his trick. The ball of dark light broke apart and flew away like a handful of dust in the wind. My body was back under my control, and I was pain-free. I flexed my stomach and brought myself to a sitting position. My clothes were covered with gore and drenched in my own blood, but every wound on my body had closed up. My skin was whole and unbroken. Even the spot on my elbow where I'd had an annoying body zit had cleared up. How? was all I could manage to say. With the power of the cosmos, darling. Bowie said. And... I paused for a long moment, struggling with which question to ask first. How are you here? I came across the vastness of the galaxy, riding on a ship made of light. He replied. And... I paused again, but for a shorter moment. How is it that you are David Bowie? My dear, you made me David Bowie. When I found you three here, I searched your minds for a form that would be pleasing to you all. Within your mind, this form was very strong. And within the others, it held positive feelings as well. So I remade myself in this image. He held his hand out to me, and I took it. He pulled me to my feet, then stepped back. Joey pushed her way past him to stand in front of me. Despite my newly whole and unblemished state, the fear and anxiety hadn't left Joey's face. She looked me up and down. Are you okay, Chloe? She asked, her voice catching on my name. I smiled. Yeah, Joey. I've never felt better. I'm perfect. In a husky whisper, she said, I thought you were dead. I thought that you had died, that that car had... She looked me up and down again, and then again. Then she stepped in and embraced me hard, almost desperately. I thought you were dead. She said again, I'm not, Joey. I'm okay. I'm okay. Suddenly, Joey's lips were on mine. She was kissing me, passionately, frantically. Don't ever leave me again, Chloe. Ever. I dug my fingers into her back, gripping her tightly, and kissed her back, unleashing all the pent-up longing I'd felt for her for all the years that we had been friends. I couldn't believe it. I'd wanted this for so long, and it was finally happening. Oh my god, no way! I heard Zoe say from behind us. How did I not see this coming? We kissed for a moment longer, our bodies pressed unbearably tight together in a vice grip of an embrace. Then we both stepped back, panting. Oh my god. Zoe said as she stepped up to us and hugged us both. 
You guys are the cutest. This is so great. It was nice to see that she didn't freak out. I would have understood if she had. It seems to me like discovering that your two besties that you've been hanging around with night and day for years were actually in love would be a decent reason to freak out. Instead, she was reveling in it. Okay, she said, stepping back again. Go ahead, kiss again. We both giggled and stepped together for a quick peck, to which Joey squealed as if she was a tween that had just encountered her favorite boy band. I put my arm around Joey's waist and turned back to the alien creature that was here posing as David Bowie. Okay, Mr. Bowie, I said. Oh, no. Please, call me David. Okay, David, I said. I'm not done with my questions. So, you've flown across the universe in a ship made of light with the power of the cosmos in your hands. But why? Why are you here? When my people finally reached a state of pure enlightenment and metamorphosed into beings of energy and light, we dispersed in all directions to take our state of perfect happiness and spread it to all beings throughout all the oceans of space, on every star and every planet. Does that sound like something you'd like to experience, Chloe? He smiled that enchanting Bowie smile and said, I hope I didn't blow your mind. Was he... it? Still reading my thoughts? Or had it pulled a knowledge of all of Bowie's songs from my head when he pulled his image as well? I smiled back at him. That sounds wonderful, David. Go ahead and blow my mind again and again. Please take me away from here. Anything would be better than going home to my shitty trailer to listen to my mom scream at me some more. I looked over at Joey, who smiled and laid her head on my shoulder, and Zoe, who nodded her head vigorously. The only thing I ask is that Joey and Zoe can come with us, too, wherever it is we are headed. David Bowie stepped back and performed a lavish bow. Your wish is granted, my dear. Then he took us by the hands. Joey and I separated and took Zoe's hands in ours. Happiness and joy will be yours forever. I laughed at that. Happiness and joy. Happiness and Joey. This day had been the most wonderful of my entire life. I had been run over by a hit-and-run driver in a high-speed collision, and my bones and organs ground into the pavement, and still it had been the happiest day of my life. And now every day from here on out would be just as wonderful. I smiled as wide as my face would allow as the alien light grew and grew until it enveloped us and whisked us away forever. The beeping of the hospital monitors and the sniffling of Chloe's friends set Claire's teeth on edge. She'd heard that there were different stages of grief and that anger was one of them, but still she felt guilty for being mad rather than sad. Her only daughter lay crushed and broken on a hospital bed, only still living because of the machines that were doing the work of her internal organs for her. And Claire hadn't shed a single tear yet. She'd screamed and yelled and punched her fist against the wall, but she hadn't cried once. She just couldn't come to terms with this turn of events. When her husband, Martin, had overdosed years ago, she swore she'd do everything she could to give Chloe the best life possible. Sadly, there had been precious little she could do. She'd been nigh on unemployable, with no education to speak of and precious few skills to offer as well. But still, she'd scratched and clawed her way through life so that she could give Chloe a future that would be better than her own. She'd debased herself at times to make ends meet so that Chloe would never have to do the same. She'd sacrificed whatever future she might have had of her own so that Chloe's future would be bright. And now that was all gone. Chloe had no future at all. And all the sacrifices and suffering were for nothing. Somebody traveling on Highway 12 on their way to Missoula had blasted Chloe with their car until her body was nothing more than a bag of broken bones. And they hadn't even stopped to see if they could help her. Amazingly, she'd hung on to life for three days now which was way more than any of the doctors expected. But it was time to pull the plug. There was nothing left inside her, nothing more going on in her head. Her brain had finally decided to close up shop, just like the rest of her organs had already done. Claire was so unbelievably angry. 
She looked at Chloe's little friends, Joey and Zoe. So silly that all their names rhymed. Those two hadn't left her side the entire time. They were hoping and praying for some kind of miraculous healing. But this was the real world, and there were no miraculous healings here. But despite their obvious love and devotion to her daughter, all Claire wanted to do was to scream at them. What the hell were you thinking? She wanted to shout. What were you doing out in the road in pitch black darkness in the middle of nowhere? Instead, she laid a hand on each of their shoulders and whispered. I'm sorry. The doctors began unhooking all the machines that were attached to her daughter until all that was left was that annoyingly beeping heart monitor. As each machine was rolled out of the room... Claire couldn't help thinking of the complete financial ruin she would soon find herself in. The health insurance from the diner was shit, and she didn't have any money to spare for the endless stream of bills she knew were coming her way. Joey got up and walked to Chloe's side, taking one of her broken hands in her own. Shortly, Zoe did the same with the other hand. Claire went to her bedside as well and squatted so that her head was right beside her daughter's head. Chloe's breathing had immediately become strained once the breathing machine had been disconnected. The beeps from the heart monitor grew more and more seldom. Oh, Chloe. Joey said through a wash of tears and sniffles. I love you. Go on to whatever better world is waiting for you. Then the beeping stopped altogether and became one long, droning tone. Her heart had stopped. Her lungs no longer rose and fell. Chloe was completely gone now. I love you too, Chloe. Claire whispered in the ear of her dead daughter. I wish it hadn't ended like this. She hung her head and whispered, If only things could have been different. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening. That was Chloe, Joey, Zoe, and David Bowie. Okay, a quick cast list for this story. Uh, Renee Chambliss was Zoe. Abigail Hilton was, I believe her name was Claire, the mother of uh, Chloe. Tina Kolakowski played um, Chloe, who was the main character. And Wendy Repchin was... Uh, Joey. (laughs) Uh, And then the uh, whole thing was produced by Jonathan Wilson, who did a pretty awesome job for his first time. It was pretty amazing. Now's probably the time that we could talk about the title. (laughs) Okay. I mean, now it seems to me, and and it seems to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind, pig. But (laughs) that's an Elton John song. It's not a David Bowie song. Yeah, that doesn't have Um, anything to do with anything. But it seems to me that you and I had a conversation about shitty parents that name their kids with rhyming names. <laughs> and it's like, this is Brant and Trant and Kent. Kent. There you go. I was, I was trying to find a, a racial slur that rhymed with Kent. And you're just like, oh, gosh, why would you? Why? Why would you do that? You're, oh, that's horrible. And it's something I don't know if we agreed on, but it certainly drives me up the wall. It's just like, wait, no, you should have been sterilized. You don't get to have kids when you do stuff like that. <laughs> And what? you said, well, you know, next story I write, all the kids are going to have rhyming names, so F you. Uh, and it not only was n- named that way, but the title had all the rhyming names in it. Does Am I remembering that correctly, or is that... Oh, I think you're tell, just making things up. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> tell me the actual origin of this story, the, then. The origin of this story, or the title, anyways, I should say... The title is the origin of the story, first of all. Um, But yeah, one day I was uh, just driving home with my daughter and she was telling me about what she had done the day before or something like that. She said, yeah, uh, I was with Zoe and we were riding our bikes and then um, we went over to Chloe's house. And for some reason, (laughs) the fact that she had two friends named Chloe and Zoe struck me as an absolutely hilarious thing. And so I immediately started giving a crap. Oh, yeah, you went over to Chloe's house and, and then what? You met Joey and then you started listening to David Bowie. 
She was just like, Dad. You know how kids do that, Dad. Yeah, I, I haven't been around your family in so long that I was shocked to discover that your children are at the age where they hate you. <laughs> and I was just like, holy cow, that's so weird. Yeah. It's like, yeah, hey, I, son, I, how'd you do in school today? F*** you. And I was just like, oh, wow. Um, I have earned it by I doing do that kind of stuff. I remember hating my parents that much, but uh, <laughs> it's so weird that, you, that the shoe is now on the other foot. But yeah, so I was giving her a whole bunch of crap. And then after a while, as we were, we were still driving, I started thinking, you know what? That would make a great title to a story. You could have Chloe and Joey and Zoe could be like the main characters. And I don't know how David Bowie could fit into that, but that would be great. And so then and there, I basically just decided, okay, I'm writing a story that's going to be titled this. And I told you, and uh, yeah, I think you almost went blind with the force of your eye rolling. <laughs> Uh, that does sound <laughs> familiar to me. Um, the uh, Did you ever watch any movies uh, made by AIP, American International Pictures? They were the drive-in studio. They made movies for teenagers, and so it was always exploitation and horror films and beach party movies and all that stuff. And their whole business model was they would come up with a title first, uh, and they would say – you know, they would – pitch the title at a bunch of teenagers and say, how many of you would go see a movie called, you know, I was a teenage werewolf. And they're like, oh, okay, that's our next movie. Come on out to see it when it comes out. And then they'd be like, okay, so let's come up with a poster for I was a teenage werewolf. All right. How's this poster? Look? Oh, it looks good. Let's show it to the teens. Would you go see a movie with this poster? And then after they got the seal of approval on that, they'd say, okay, now I guess we need to hire somebody to write it and direct it. And, and they work them. backwards. They would work backwards from the title. And so I just – I thought of that with you. It's like, okay, he he had a title, had no idea what it was going to go with, but he, he worked backwards from there. Yeah, I did. It, it's funny because titles are almost always my Achilles heel. Like the last story that we ran on here uh, from me – was called Wrong Ingredients. Would you go and see a story called Wrong Ingredients, teens? You know, they're well, going like blind from the eye roll. Wrong. <laughs> Wong Ingredients? How about that? The schlong ingredients, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the dong ingredients? I, I see it's getting better and better. Thanks, John. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, see, that's a terrible title, but... It's what I could come up with. I have a tendency to not be able to come up with good titles. Unless, like, the title comes to me really early on, or it just kind of comes out. It suggests itself to me before I get very far. Then I think, oh, okay, this is a good title. But other times, yeah, I, I don't have anything. And so, oh, well, I guess wrong ingredients? <laughs> I kind of... So having a title to work from from the very beginning, thats this. I think this is the first time I've ever done that. Having a title and, and then going from that. Um, I think there was a time once where you wanted to just take Metallica songs and just be like, okay, you have these three Metallica songs. Go write flash pieces that have to do with this. Yeah, the effed up thing is I was going to bring that up myself. It's like before we ever had a Dune Steve podcast that ate up all of our time. I challenged you. There's like, okay, let's get a bunch of Metallica le uh, titles, and we're going to write stories based on these Metallica titles because you liked Metallica, and I thought maybe I would enable you in some way to. to <laughs> and they have write. good song titles. I mean, you take something like "Frayed Ends of Sanity," and you can probably come up with some kind of an interesting story with that as your title. Yeah, there was this really, really good title, and I can't remember. And you're too close to it to know which title I'm thinking of, but. I just remember thinking, oh, that's such a great title for a for a story. I guess I'll cut that part. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, you know, if you if you win that lottery that everybody's talking about, um, which is long in the past to the listeners, then yeah, we could do that whole Metallica thing. I considered doing that instead of what we did tonight. Just saying, hey, we're driving and we're gonna go buy ourselves some <laughs> tickets. That would have been fun. I keep thinking, I mean, you and I, it's been two years since we went on a road trip. 
which is sort of a lie, but it's not. Because we did go to my family cabin one night, but it took yeah. 90 minutes to yeah, get there. Yeah, it's not. But I thought, yeah, oh gosh, it would be just fun to get in your car, your tiny little car, with a brand new Zoom H1 that was bought for us by listener contributions and to just go through another story to come up. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to work through a whole story and we're going to write it together. And I don't know. I all love that sort of stuff, the brainstorming or, you know, I've, uh-huh. I've been working on this and what happens next. And you come up with what happens next. And then I come up with what happens after that sort of stuff. We don't do that near enough. We're getting old and there's just too much stuff biting into our time. And yeah, I don't know. Somebody asked me the other day if, if I had ever been to, like, there's one of those national monuments that's, that's seriously like two hours away. And I was like, no, never. It's just too far. <laughs> <laughs> watching two thirds of interstellar and I'd be there, you know, but anyway, yeah, we, we, uh, sorry, we should write more and whoever's listening, you should write more too. Unless you are Munsey, you should write less. <laughs> less. I mean, it just, just take a day off, man. But yeah. Um, so when, when I woke up this morning and discovered that David Bowie had died, First of all, I was blown away because I didn't even know he was sick. Uh, he died of cancer that he'd been dealing with for 18 months. And I'd never heard anything about this. And he'd, he'd released a new album like two days ago. So generally, that's not someone who's like on death's door. They don't do that. They're not out like, oh, yeah, well, why don't I record another album real quick? And So it was a real surprise to me. I had no idea that something like this was coming. The interesting thing is, I've never really been much of a David Bowie fan. When I came up with that title for that story, I went, okay, I got to work David Bowie into this story somehow. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm going to have to do some research. And so I started listening to David Bowie music and watching some like various documentaries about David Bowie and Ziggy Stardust and all that kind of stuff that you could find on YouTube or uh, Netflix or wherever it was that I discovered them. And uh, I became a fan of David Bowie by way of this story. I kind of liked his stuff. You know, his stuff was okay. There was a few songs of his that I liked. I loved Space Oddity. Uh, that's one that I've liked since I was a kid. and But, I mean, it's his most famous song, so most people probably know that more than any other. But, yeah, I became a real fan of all of his other stuff. Which I think is kind of, <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of weird to make myself into a fan of David Bowie by way of writing a story <laughs> that includes his name in the title. It doesn't actually include him, you know. But uh, wait, well, what impression was I doing then during that whole time? Well, he wasn't the David Bowie. Oh, he was... hence the terrible impression. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Have you been, are you a fan of David Bowie? He seems like the kind of dude that you would probably be into. He's all wearing makeup and has the hair like the Smiths and the Cure and all those bands that you loved growing up. Although by this point, David Bowie was old and out, right? Yeah, I I, I didn't know David Bowie. I, uh, I guess probably like Let's Dance came out while uh-huh. I was a kid. But, but I can't think of any other hits he would have had during my childhood. Uh, my introduction to David Bowie really was um, my uncle died and he left my mom all of his records. And I w- went through them and I, I culled three or four that I thought might be interesting. And uh, the one that I would listen to over and over and over and over again was the Rocky Horror Picture Show soundtrack. Okay. But he had this album called uh, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. And I was just like, whoa, what the heck? <laughs> so I grabbed that and I took it in the record player, you know, and uh, and I listened to it and yeah, it was just probably too much over my head. But I did listen to that Ziggy Stardust, you know, song over and over Ziggy again, you know. played guitar. Like some cat from Japan. <laughs> when the kids had killed the man, I had to break up the band. 
Uh, I just I used to listen to that over and over again. It was I, I don't know why. I guess I was trying to find some kind of sci-fi angle of the spiders from Mars being literal, and and that and and anyway, that was pretty much my introduction to Bowie. And did you ever look up the story of the album and the whole bit? No, not until I was an old man. Probably around the same time that you said, "Oh, I've been." I watched a documentary about Ziggy Stardust, so I went out to research it so I wouldn't sound foolish when we talked about it. And then you never brought it up again. (laughs) It's interesting stuff. I mean, I've heard, I listened to the classic rock station growing up. So a a fair amount of his songs you could find on there sometimes, but not often because he was only sort of in that realm. Yeah. The classic rock station I listened to, the only song they play is Under Pressure, which is great, but I think they play it because of Queen. They don't play it because of huh. Bowie. They would play uh, Space Oddity on mm. there. Plenty. That's where I heard that from. But uh, on rare occasions, they would play songs like uh, like the Ziggy Stardust song. Um, what other song would they play from that? They play Fame. I don't think they would play Fame. Fame was a little too funky. Funky. Yes, yeah, Funky Brewster. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty dang cool. Have we never made that joke before? <laughs> Sorry that I'm finding that so amusing. <laughs> to, uh, I, I want to say, you know, I think... On Nirvana's Unplugged album, they played a cover of The Man Who Sold the World. Yeah, okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I knew We could be heroes his... just for one day. Yeah, there was... I know that Diamond one from Dawn. the from the freaking uh, cover version by The Wallflowers. Yeah, <laughs> Sadly, that's where too. I first heard that. Most of his stuff, though, yeah, like Let's Dance and... and... China Girl? Fame and China Girl and stuff. I heard those on the regular Top 40 station in the 80s and not uh, on the the classic rock station. So he was one of those guys. He he did so much, so many different styles. He never stuck with one thing or the other. You know, he started as like a folk singer kind of a guy. And then he moved into this crazy glam kind of a guy. Then suddenly he was a soul singer. Then he was the Goblin King. I mean, what? <laughs> what about that creepy duet he did with Bing Crosby? Oh, gosh. That Peace is, on the That is the worst. Can it be? <laughs> that is, yeah, a really terrible song. I know you hate that version, but I just, yeah, I, I guess that was a hallmark in so many people's, like the generation above mine's childhoods. They, they, yeah, they just loved that. And if you ever watch that, Crosby is like so creeped out to be with Bowie, and he's just like, Ugh. "This is my agent said I had to do this to be popular with the kids." <laughs> but yeah, David Bowie was definitely a different kind of dude. Y- you could never tell what his deal was, even to the, his dying day. I'm pretty sure the guy was bisexual, but I'm not certain. He was married more than once to a woman. He married a supermodel, which yeah. is what most rock stars do, but he didn't divorce the supermodel. He didn't fight or beat her up or whatever other weird crap that rock stars tend to do with their supermodel girlfriends. He was one of those dudes that had always had the coolest friends. He was the guy, you know, like how every rap song has... Uh, like, for example, like Pitbull comes out with a new song, but it's never just Pitbull. It's, it's Pitbull featuring. Featuring, yeah. Will and I Am. and A whole yeah. list of people. Will I Am and Eminem and... John Denver. And yeah. The, the greats, the luminary rap artists. So that's the thing now. But, like, seems like he was always doing that kind of stuff. Bowie, back in the day, he had the song with Queen. Can you think of... A- Another band that just out of the blue had a song with some other guy in the 70s or the, even the 80s. There was a few. I guess Michael Jackson did his Paul McCartney Paul McCartney songs. 
Uh, and is Stevie Wonder, see, was Stevie Wonder that he'd Ebony and Ivory with? Or was, no, that was Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder, right? I'm totally mixing that up. Yeah, right. So Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. Oh, okay. We'll forget. But anyways, you got a few of those, a few duets, My Endless Love or whatever. But for the most part, people didn't do that. But Bowie had, you know, Brian Eno. He did several albums, uh, collaborating with Brian Eno. He had... That I'm afraid of American song I where do remember he that. did it with uh, with Trent Reznor from uh, Nine, Inch Nine Inch Nails, and on and on. If Plus that's... his bulge in Labyrinth <laughs> inspired an entire generation, or, or or brought into pubescence an entire generation. <laughs> I have heard a lot of females talk about how much they like David Bowie. Because of that. In the labyrinth. They yeah. never mentioned his bulge. He was doing the Lord's work there. Because you, yes. <laughs> you mentioned his bulge because apparently it was important to you. They never say, they never say the bulge out loud and admit to it, but they but always talk about it. Yes. Yeah, they may be thinking it. I wouldn't be surprised. Like the, the girl, I, I cut a news story today about David Bowie's uh, death and they interviewed a local radio DJ and yeah. Her favorite Bowie song was Dance Magic Dance. And that's from Labyrinth? Yes. You remind me of the babe. <laughs> Is there a bulge in that? Oh, I'm moment? sure there's plenty of bulge in it. He's dancing a magic dance. <laughs> so that's probably the magic part of the dance. But yeah, I know that Bowie means a lot to a lot of people. He was that guy. He was like... Marilyn Manson, way before Marilyn Manson came along, the guy that would push the envelope, the guy who would say, hey, you know, so what? I'm wearing makeup. What's wrong with that? Apparently nothing. Everybody loves me. <laughs> so what? So what if I look like a girl? So what? You know, and there's these, there's people out there who were, and gosh, in those days... There was almost no acceptance, you know what I mean? And the things have changed substantially, and uh, people who are young don't remember what things were like because they weren't there, so they couldn't. But they don't know what things were like. I mean, a lot of people think that there's struggles now, but the struggles were so much more intense in those days, and these people had no one to turn to. You know, if you had, if you were what they call gender fluid now or uh you know you were gay or you were bisexual or you were you know or you had one eye that was green and one eye that was brown yeah that could have been really you know hard on somebody <laughs> unless they had this person that they could look up to and all sorts of people love david bowie he was much more loved than marilyn manson ever was Right, but Bowie was actually talented. Well, yeah, there's probably that. But um, I think that he ushered in a lot of acceptance for a lot of people that were feeling none of it before. I know uh, one of my favorite bands from the 70s is The Runaways, which was... It was Joan Jett. Though. Yeah, Joan Jett was the lead guitarist and sometimes singer of the band. And... I, I read somewhere that every one of the uh, members of the band had some rock star that they looked up to and patterned themselves after. Like Joan Jett patterned herself after Susie Quattro. But the lead singer, Sherry Curry, patterned herself after David Bowie and uh, really tried to, you know, she had her hair cut similar to his and everything in it. So, you know, another person that used him. And I, I, I saw a thing today where Marilyn Manson said that David Bowie was one of his idols that he actually looked up to and, I guess, patterned his life after him in some ways. And, and you can see that. In my childhood, Boy George was the one. You right. know, that was the, I don't want to say poster boy, but he was the one that, you know, the parents just, <laughs> And I would, uh, there's no chance that Boy George was not influenced by Bowie. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I I didn't know he had died. I, I've been working all day, and uh, I don't work in a place where I have internet or any human contact at all. 
So yeah, you told me, and it's like, oh shoot, that's 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 too bad. Somebody had said it last night uh, on a chat board or whatever, and and so I I was like, well, I'm gonna go look on Wikipedia. I, I know I've complained to you about this, but I've not complained to anybody else. I meant to put it on Facebook, but there there started to be these not even erroneous but fallacious headlines that would show up as ads on the side of my Facebook page. That would be like, you know, oh, America mourns death of Sylvester Stallone. And it's like Chuck Norris, da- dead at, you know, 61 or 81 or however old he is. And I'd be, and it's clickbait. And when you click on it, it's not an article about Sylvester Stallone dying. It's evil. And I was just like, hey, dude, that is not right. I mean, seriously, that there's that's immoral, those kind of things. And I hope that those people not only go out of business, but are raped. So I thought this was another one of those things yesterday, uh, last night. And so I went to Wikipedia because that's my uh, expert advice. Yeah, Max, my uh, oracle. <laughs> and yeah, Wikipedia didn't say anything about his death. And so I uh, I just dismissed it and then until you told me today. Yeah, yeah. That, whoever you heard that from must have been like one of the first responders or something <laughs> like that. I don't, I don't know. Because uh, yeah, I didn't hear about it till this morning. And I was pretty... I was pretty sad. I immediately thought of that story uh, that we just listened to. And I thought, you know what? In honor, if you can say this is in honor of, of his death or celebrating his life, I'm going to post this. I So I just posted it straight up on the blog. I've had this story actually on Smashwords for, I don't know, a year. And I think one person bought it, and I think it was Marshall Latham. So, oh, what a good guy. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's where that's gone. But I just like, you know what? Screw that. I'm going to post this for anyone to read. And I, I don't know if anyone read it yet. Probably nobody did. And they're just hearing it for the first time now uh, on this show. But yeah, I figured, you know what? I'm, I'm going to, I don't know if, if that counts as honoring. So here, read my story because of David Bowie. Or if that's just, you know, profiteering, capitalizing on it, getting people to read my stuff because David Bowie died. I don't think that that's why I did it. I don't feel like that's why I'm doing it. But I, I suppose there's a possibility you could look at it that way. But yeah, I just wanted it to be in honor of... Because he had a really impressive life. He did a lot of stuff. Made a lot of great music. That Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars album, I love. That's the one album I, I went through and downloaded a whole bunch of his albums when I was uh, researching. researching him. That's the one that I kept in its entirety. And then other than that, I just kind of made a, a greatest hits from the rest of it. Because I like some of his stuff, but I really prefer the stuff from, yeah, 69 to 74 or so. It's when all the really good songs were. Is as far as I'm concerned. I mean, because he changed so much from year to year to year, it's hard almost to be a David Bowie fan. It's like, do I want to? Which listen period to of all Bowie were you? Right, yeah. Do you want to listen to? Uh, do you want to listen to the stuff that he did with Trent Reznor? I'm not interested. But well, you and I back in October saw The Martian together. And they use the, he's a star man waiting in the sky. There's a star man waiting in the sky. And you <laughs> sang along to that in the theater. And I was like, wow, I, I don't know that song. That's really weird. And But you knew it because of your research to yep, the Bowie I did. thing. I'd heard it before I did the research, but I didn't know it. Mm-hmm. Okay. I wouldn't have been able to sing along with it. I'd just been like, oh, that's that Ziggy thing. <laughs> But uh, I wonder if there are other artists that I could do the same thing with. Like, for example, Bruce Springsteen is an artist that all sorts of people think is great. You're not a fan. I am not a fan. I, I His stuff is so-so. Mm. I've never... I don't think I could say I even like any of his songs, much less love. But if I made a story like Arlene... And Gene and Bruce Springsteen, would I be able to become a fan of him by way of doing research? Or would that not be the case? It makes me wonder. I, I don't know. I, Bruce Springsteen is 
it was so much more mainstream in our youths and, and adulthood that is, it's amazing to me that you wouldn't already be a fan or you, you would be a fan if you were ever going to be uh -huh. by this point. Um, he's got an album called Darkness on the Edge of Town. And the first Ooh. time I heard about, I heard that, and that was like 25 years ago, I was just like, oh my gosh, one day I'm going to write a story <laughs> called Darkness on the Edge of Town or a story collection or a novel called Darkness. Like, oh my gosh. I just loved that. And then I heard the song and I'm, I still want to do it, but it, it didn't, it didn't suddenly open up a door and it's like, okay, now I know what the story is going to be about. But yeah, sorry, but it was, now we're talking about Springsteen. Oh, that's okay. We can have tangents. He'll get his, his yeah. episode someday. Hopefully not someday soon. It's pretty sad. Bowie was 69, but just barely. I think his birthday was the day that his album came out, which was like two days ago. 69 is not very old. It would be nice if, if Springsteen could live longer than that. Or anybody, really, when it comes down to it. Nobody wants to die before 69, because it's not that old. Except for Polly Shore, remember? Oh, Polly Shore, right. I forgot about him. <laughs> I don't know. There are a lot of these guys that they wouldn't have been around Raleigh, for so long. Macaulay, and Polly. Oh, gross. <laughs> Macaulay, I guess, technically is a real name, but yikes. <laughs> but there, you know, there's a lot of these artists and, that have been around for a long, long time, and... and I would think if you went spelunking in their catalog, you would find something to love about most of these guys. I, every once in a while, there's somebody where you're just like, I don't get their popularity. I just, oh, I hate the voice or I hate, you know, that all of their songs are about this or, you know, whatever the deal is. Uh -huh. But, you know, you were talking about Pitbull and, you know, the, the, the popular music of today, just for the most part, it doesn't do it for me. But uh, the stuff from the 70s, I don't know. It seems still resonant. You can hear something from before our time and then play it for your kids and they can respond to it as well. I mean, you know, maybe that's the case with Pitbull too, but I, I somehow doubt it. Yeah, I think I mentioned this once years ago, but uh, they say the generation gap is smaller than it's ever been. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but basically – there's less of a generation gap. There's not like your dad listens to swing music and you listen to rock and roll. Ah! And and they're not sure exactly what the deal is. But youth today are listening to, I don't know, ACDC and all that kind of stuff. And more so, it's like the new music. Even the kids today know the new music that's coming out isn't quite as awesome as the stuff that came out back in the day. And they listen to that stuff as much as or more than they do the stuff that's new. And I, one of my daughters is super into older stuff. And Define another, older stuff. <laughs> like, for example, she's been listening to Journey okay. nonstop for the last few weeks and singing along at full volume to Don't Stop Believing and When the Lights Go Down in the City, etc. Okay. And I have another daughter who puts one foot in both camps. She loves 80s music, 70s music, stuff like that, but also really likes whatever the hell they listen to these days. <laughs> the stuff that I gave up on about three to four years ago, I just completely just gave up on. I said, you know what? There's nothing to bother with. If something's really good that I'm going to like, I'll probably eventually hear it. And the rest I can just do without. And there is that paradox, or I don't know what they call it, but it's like the, you know, you say, oh, I like things better the way they used to be than the way things are now. Um, you say music is better back in the day than it is now, but the thing is, when you look back and you remember music from back in the day, you only remember the good stuff. You don't remember the crap. That was on the radio that never made it past number 39 on the top 40 chart. But you still heard it 30, 40 times before it went away. Whereas now you're hearing all that stuff plus the good stuff. So maybe it's not true, but I I don't care. I'm not listening to the top 40 station anymore. I leave the top 40 station on my radio now, though. 
which my wife sometimes drives my car and she'll change the channel to that and I'll get in the car and I'll turn it on. And the thing about it is it's so bad that immediately I'm like, Oh crap, I need to. Yeah. It's funny. It's like I, I get in the car with you and it's like, I'm your dad and there's a dirty movie you've been watching and you'll instantly be like, Oh, I, 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 I didn't, my, my wife must've, <laughs> you've done that a couple of times. You did it today. Yeah. And you're just like so embarrassed and ashamed. I, please don't judge me. I, I don't like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I hate it. It's so bad. And I, and I realized that what I've been doing a lot before was I like get into my car and then, you know, whatever I was listening to would come on and I would start driving and then I'd realize, oh, I had an audiobook that I was listening to. I need to put that in. And so I'll be like driving and like trying to hook my phone up to the thing and then like finding my Audible app and getting to the thing and play it the whole time. I'm like trying to drive and watch the road and watch the phone. And of course, he's trying to text too. Eventually, I'm going to crash and kill myself. And so now I've decided I'm going to leave this crappy top 40 station on the radio so that immediately I will put my phone on. Before I start driving, because I'll be safe that way. Aww. It's a safety measure now. The, the absolute shite music that comes out of that station is perfect to keep me from driving dangerously. Well, that's good. Then that means Drake <laughs> isn't all bad. That's right. It has its uses. We're way off course. We were talking about David Bowie. We were. And, you know, what are you going to do? Maybe we've made it to the end of that. I think so. We probably talked a lot. I hope people liked your story. And uh, I had, we asked people if they would donate, right? Well, maybe we didn't. Maybe this is far in the future and people have donated and we don't need no more. Do Wait, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Please donate to the show. Yeah, let's let's mention it again. Just donate to the show. We need some uh, some funds to replace some equipment that has gotten old and shoddy. It's caused a lot of issues recently and so we are uh, trying to replace that stuff so the issues will go away and we'll be able to get out more episodes so if you like the dune steve and you want more episodes if you donate then we could replace that and have more episodes so yeah swing by the site dunesteve.com we've got the little buttons right on the side you click on them and you can donate five bucks a month five bucks a quarter or you can just donate whatever it is you want a one-time donation you just click on that one and you can pick a number yeah any amount is appreciated that's right so yeah thanks for listening to the story i hope you liked it and uh thanks for being there keep listening to the dune steve and keep listening to bowie that's he's, right he's gone but he doesn't need to be forgotten thanks for listening everybody we'll see you later tell my wife i love her very much she knows The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Lovely. Take two. He was one of those dudes that had always had the coolest friends. Like, he was the guy, you know, like how every rap song has, you know, it's... I'm trying to think of somebody who's current. Who's a, who's a current rap star? I don't, I don't listen to rap, so... What's the name of that person my niece really likes? I almost said Eminem. Yeah, well, you always use Pitbull as the worst example. Oh, okay. Because it's just... I'll use Pitbull. Less. He is current enough. I Okay, we'll see Pitbull. But if I made a story called Gene... Come on, give me more names that rhyme with Steen. Oh. <laughs> Arlene. Gene. And there's there's a bunch of like Raylene and Kayleen and... and is there one that's... Ray... Like... Shoot, Arlene. Yeah, yeah. One that's more Ean that's not with an L, like a Ray instead of Raylene, like Ray Jean, Ray 
Steve McQueen. <laughs> Mardine. What about a Indian name? <laughs> Just tell the joke. All right. Stay. Bark, bark, wag tail. Good boy. Good boy. Uh, really big? Seriously? <laughs>